good evening, everybody. Allow me to introduce a, a, a long-term friend of mine, Kristen Surak. She's a senior lecturer, which is equivalent to associate professor in Japanese politics at SOAS, which is an acronym for the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Her specialties include international migration, nationalism, culture, and political sociology. She is currently uh, here back in the United States, her home country, uh, where she is a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Her book uh, entitled Making Tea, Making Japan, Cultural Nationalism in Practice st is, was published at, by Stanford Univer University Press in 2013. And she received the Outstanding Book Award of the American Sociological Association's section on Asia for this book. She has published in the European Journal of Sociology, in uh, International Migration Review, Mercure, uh, Ethnic and Racial Studies, Lettres Internationales, and New Left Review, among other publications. And her work has been translated into various language, languages, including Japanese, Spanish, Swedish, and German. She received her PhD at UCLA. And the two of us met about uh, 10 years ago when she had uh, pulled off the coup of, getting, of accepting both a Japan Foundation uh, Graduate Study Fellowship and a Fulbright Hayes. Uh, and she did this by pursuing two research programs that were, uh, were completely unrelated. And I saw presentations on both, and they were quite fascinating. Uh, one was on immigration policy in Japan. The other was on the topic we're going to look at today, on the sociology of uh, tea ceremony in Japan. Uh, Dr. Surak has also received awards and fellowships from the American Academy of Political and Social Science, uh, the European U University Institute the Frank uh, from Frankfurt University, the University of California Board of Regents, and the Sainsbury Foundation in Great Britain. She has taught at UCLA and at the University of Duisburg, Essen. Her comments regularly uh, appear, uh, well, she comments regularly for the B BBC, for Deutsche Welle, for Al Jazeera, and Radio France Internationale. And uh, Dr. Surak's cr uh, current research compares migration regimes and temporary migrant labor programs in East Asia and worldwide. So uh, with no further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Surak. Thanks very much. Um, so I do do a lot of work on migration, but tea is still very near and dear to my heart. And it's really such an honor to be here at the opening of this institute. It's a fantastic initiative. And um, I'll be excited to see how it develops in, in the years to come. Um, so far, we've heard quite a lot about tea objects, tea types, the health benefits of tea. But what I want to do is focus on the making of tea and the social forms around it. Tea is, after all, a drug. It's a caffeinated beverage. And there are always social rules that guide the intake of these sorts of things, whether it's from you know, the requisite toast uh, with, with a glass of wine or a beer or you know, anything like this. But in the Japanese tea ceremony in particular, these are taken to an extreme, and in a way that has become, come to be seen over time as representing the nation as well. So what I'll do today is offer a brief introduction to the Japanese tea ceremony, what people do when they're doing tea in Japan, and then explore some of the ways that something as mundane as tea drinking has become such a powerful site for maintaining and making, in a sense, Japanese-ness. So to start off, I, I don't know how many people here have actually been to um, a sort of taster for, of a Japanese tea ceremony. If you go to Japan, it's, they're pretty common to find in a sort of truncated form, 20 minutes or so, of just a ritual tea preparation. But what I'll introduce is the full tea ceremony affair, the, the chaji. This is um, an incredibly involved um, uh, sort of social event. It takes about four hours in total. One is served a 12-course meal and several servings of tea. Now, typically, as you, as you probably can imagine, it takes several weeks of preparation, and it ain't cheap to do either. Um, and it, because it's so involved, tea practitioners will attend them only a few times a year. But this is sort of the, um, the epitome that all other forms of tea preparation, you know, chado, the um, the traditional form, um, look to. Um, the 
formal tea ceremony begins um, in the garden when the host, this will be our host for today, sorry if it's a little bit dark, um, sprinkles water around as a symbol of hospitality. It sort of signifies um, freshness and purity. And he does this while the guests um, gather and wait in an arbor. They see him doing this and they recognize a sort of um, consideration for them. The guests then proceed into the garden and to what is, you can see a little bit at the bottom, is a stone basin um, filled with water where they'll purify their hands and mouth, much in the same way that it's, it's still done when one goes to um, a shrine or a temple um, in preparation for going into the tea room. Then they enter the tea room, and if it's a traditional tea room, the door is very, very short. It's only about, you know, say, two and a half feet high, square. You can see him kind of looking into the room. Um, it's interesting, there's a lot about the phenomenology of doing tea that encourages the body to take particular positions that are associated with particular attitudes um, that are very important in tea. And here this, you know, walk, getting into the tea room forces one to bow one's head and sort of assuming a position of humility, entering into what's seen as a completely um, different world. So when the guest first then enters the room. Um, he or she will go and look at the scroll that's hung um, in the alcove. Um, the scroll is, is, among all of the utensils um, used in the tea ceremony, is considered the most important because it sets the theme for the day. Typically, it's a Zen phrase, and it will be one with multiple meanings. And what's interesting um, in the tea ceremony is that it's the context that will allow the, the, the participant to hone in on what exact meaning is being referenced in that in that moment, and I'll go into that in a little bit in just a moment. Then once the guests have gathered, you can see them sort of kneeling very compactly in this very small space. So, you know, I think it's something like, you know, 12 feet by 12 feet or 16 feet by 16 feet traditionally defined. Um, the host will enter um, and greet each guest individually um, in a very formal way. Greetings are, are very important to everyday life in Japan, but here it's done um, very formally, usually with three different levels of bow, recognizing different levels in, in the interaction, with fans setting off um, guests from host, uh, et cetera. After the, after the initial greeting, then the guests are served this multi-course kaiseki cuisine, which is considered in many ways to be the epitome of um, Japanese, it's Japanese oak cuisine. Um, and it's often marketed as, as such in, in very fine restaurants. And this continues on for about an hour. Working in the kitchen behind is, uh, is actually very difficult work. Um, after after the, um, the meal is served, then the um, host, it, it varies depending on the season of the year, but in, in summer will um, prepare the charcoal for the kettle. You can see the kettle will go into the sunken hearth in, in, a, in the middle of the room, and there's about a 20 minute ritual of, of, of laying the charcoal for them on a carefully prepared bed of ash. After that, then some sweets are served, and the guests get to adjourn into the garden. By this time, they've been in the tea room for maybe 90 minutes or so, and you get to stretch your legs and have a breath of, breath of fresh air before you come back in um, for the service of tea. Um, this is also very, very involved in rule bound. The shortest versions take about 20 minutes. The longest versions take up to an hour, and it depends on the type of utensils used, the season, the, um, the shape of the room, etc. But what happens during the, the ritual preparation is largely a, a symbolic purification of the utensils um, before the tea is, is whipped up. It's, it will usually be first a bowl of thick tea, which is um, about the consistency of drinkable yogurt and very, very green. And the second will be the, the thin matcha whipped tea, which you know, in California you can get you know, pretty much at Starbucks. Um, it's, the, the host does this with a particular rhythm, attention to detail, whether the hand, left hand or right hand picks up things very carefully. And it's almost, it can be somewhat hypnotic to, to watch um, in a way. And then finally, the host will prepare the tea and set it out for um, the guest to slide up and, um, and um, imbibe in. It's interesting then looking at the, this role of host and guest as well, because the, the host has a very important role, of course, but the guest's role is highly scripted as well, and you convey a lot of attitudes and sensibilities through this. So for example, the host will set out the bowl of tea, and 
the guest has to come and collect it. But the timing is crucial. The host, it, the, the, the host will have its, his, his or her hand on the bowl, and it's the moment he or she removes it that the guest moves. Not while the hand is still there, because that will look greedy, and not after the host has, has you know, set down the bowl and returned the hand to the lap and is waiting a bit, because that would look like you're not paying attention. This sort of timing, not a moment too soon, not a moment too late, also conveys this awareness of others as well as, in, in the various interactions, a feeling of gratitude and humility, which is essential um, in, in the gathering. Um, what happens next is the, the tea is drunk finally, more tea is made, utensils are cleaned up, and then the, the guests get to view the various utensils that have been selected for the day. These are the tea bowls, the tea scoops, the water containers, and the like that have been assembled, particularly for that day, to evoke a, a, a theme that's usually in alignment uh, with the seasons and maybe recalls something from ancient poetry or a bio, biographical event of the host or the guests. And th the understanding of what that theme is emerges not from the individual utensils, but from their combination. So if you take, for example, right now, May, it's the season of irises. So irises are in bloom at Ota um, Shrine in Kyoto and at the Meiji Shrine in Tokyo. And actually, that's usually about two weeks apart, and people who are really into this will, will get that subtlety as well. So a host might have, for example, some sweets in the shape of irises. Um, and then they might include um, an, a utensil with, uh, with perhaps um, the motif of what a Shinto, of, of like the hat that a Shinto priest might wear. Or maybe the sweets will be served on something that looks like a flat paddle, but once you see the irises, you realize that flat paddle is actually the, the thing that uh, a Shinto priest will hold in, in front of his or her mouth um, to cover the mouth as well. So it's in a way you understand what the utensils are doing in, in their combination, in some you know, grasp of ancient poetry, um, as well as Japanese historical and literary events, really helps in understanding what's going on with the selection. Finally, then there are greetings as, as the host sends them off in a very formal way. So now after viewing all of this and getting a sense of what a full tea ceremony is like, um, it probably goes without saying that this, this sort of tea preparation ritual is one of the most powerful and resonant symbols of Japan. It's performed in kimono by people kneeling on tatami mats in a Japanese room, a washitsu, with a sort of refined control and very close attention to detail. Not only how it's done, but also where it's done often marks it as Japanese. It's done at culture day festivals in all of the schools. It's done at tourist spots. In Kyoto, there are about 35 places where you can go and sample matcha and eight where you can watch a formal um, preparation of tea. Um, here are a couple of these tourists. The, the, the people on the top don't just walk around a kimono every day. They're Japanese tourists going to Kyoto and deciding to have a Japanese experience by dressing up in kimono and, and doing the tea ceremony. Um, in the media as well, it often carries a distinctively Japanese sense. Um, you can see this, for example, the bottom right-hand corner was a, a subway poster in, in the neighborhood where I was living in, in Japan, where on the left you can see this modern woman doing some sort of yoga move, and then on the right you see the traditional woman, and this is all you know, being presented as different forms of femininity in Japan. Oh, What's interesting about this, I mean, one might expect the tea ceremony to be very Japanese to foreigners, um, but it doesn't have to be very Japanese as well. Uh, it, it's very interesting coming at this from a sociological point of view because what often gets labeled as national culture is simply taken for granted in its home context. We're usually like fish and water. You know, if you're, if you're in Japan and eating with chopsticks or in, in China eating with chopsticks, it's, it's not necessarily a Japanese act. It's just a way to get food into your mouth. But what's striking about the tea ceremony is the great strength of the Japanese associations with it in practice, not only outside of J Japan to foreign eyes, but also within it. You see it in places like the National Museum, where there's an entire room devoted to the tea ceremony, presented both in English and in Japanese as one of the world-renowned cultural traditions of Japan. And what's interesting as well is that even though most people don't do it, they will often feel accountable for it. If a foreigner asks a Japanese person about the tea ceremony, they'll show embarrassment in not being able to, to talk about it. Whereas if you ask about manga or anime, if they're not interested, they'll just say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. There's a very strong sense of this as being essential to Japanese culture, even if 
a you know, Japanese person might know nothing about it. Which in a way is pretty incredible, given where it was 500 years ago. Because for most of its history, tea wasn't a symbol of the Japanese. It was, among other things, crucially, a tool of statecraft. It was central to modern state form, er, central to state formation in the 16th century for both symbolic and pragmatic reasons. This was a time in the, in the late 16th century when there were samurai warriors unifying much of the Japanese archipelago and taking power from aristocrats. Now, how did these upstart warriors somehow, you know, getting to the pinnacle of power, gain legitimacy for it? They took up the cultural practices of prior elites. Aristocrats were doing tea, so they started doing this as well. That symbolic function was very important, but uh, also important was pragmatic reasons as well. So people from all sorts of status groups would meet in the tea room. On the top, we have a warrior like Toyotomi Hideyoshi, tea aficionado. And at the bottom, Sen Nikyu, who became his tea master for, for a term, who was a key merchant. Now, of course, having a, a tea, ma tea masters were often merchants, and merchants had their hand in gunpowder and food staples, which is great if you're waging war, very important to have control over those networks. And the tea space was also great for networking. It was considered a space apart where different caste um, statuses, social statuses didn't m matter. Um, People would compete over prize to, to gain prize tea bowls, which was a much more efficient way of um, claiming status and power than to say, compete on the battlefield and losing lives. Um, so the tea ceremony um, continued at this level of the, of the um, helm of state where the key rulers were doing the tea ceremony as networking, as cultural um, capital, et cetera. Um, throughout the Tokugawa era, down to the mid-19th century. It was really a prestigious thing that men did. Up until the Meiji Restoration in 1868, this threw the whole tea world into question. There was an out with the old, in with the new atmosphere. Um, the patrons of the, of, uh, the patron status groups of the tea ceremony were abolished. Tea masters were out of work. One even went to Turkey to try to get into the tobacco trade because he wasn't making enough money off of tea. So which raises a very interesting question. It was really thrown into um, a state of uncertainty. How did the tea ceremony not only survive across the Meiji Restoration, but thrive on the other side? To understand how this happened, we need to look at three key actors and a gendered division of labor that transformed the tea ceremony into a symbol of Japan. Um, first and most important, were, uh, first and very important, were the captains of industry, the sukisha, the new rising capitalist class that were taking um, over the helm of state in Japan. How, what did they do to secure legitimacy? Um, yeah, and this is very important because merchants had always been the lowest rung on the caste hierarchy. They took up the cultured practices of prior rulers. It had worked for the samurai, so the, so the new um, capitalist class were going to try this too. And, and it's really astounding, actually, to think about what this meant, to have the, this new, the new um, captains of industry doing this. There was um, the leader of Mitsui, Mitsukoshi, Sumito, Sumitomo, Tobu Railroad, Kawasaki Shipping. All of them were on their knees in a room making tea for each other. I mean, imagine someone like J.P. Morgan, let alone Donald Trump, doing this sort of activity, especially given all the refined movements, et cetera. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting in the case of these um, uh, elite men was their key fascination was with utensils, the bowls, the tea caddies, the scrolls, that were now becoming redefined into objects of distinctively Japanese art. And they saw this as their national duty to maintain them and keep them out of foreign collections. So for them, tea ceremony was above all about connoisseurship. And I don't have the writing for the, um, writing on this for the, the slide. It's interesting that at, at one point, um, Masuda Takashi, who was running Mitsui, which was taking care of about a third of Japan's exports. If you wanted to rise up in Mitsui, you had to know the tea ceremony. Um, hugely important for him at the time. He would write about the tea ceremony that tea ota is a form of pleasure. What's interesting is that when he writes ota, he doesn't use the honorific o that many people are used to in Japanese, uh, his sort of hiragana o, but he writes it with a Chinese character that means masculinity, hu o. So 
he writes, men's tea, in a way, is, is a form of pleasure. And he does that because he's trying to defend it against a new, dangerous set of actors, women. Now, Meiji Japan was, was, had, you know, did many, many amazing things um, in terms of rolling out the infrastructure of the state. And one thing that it did was mandate um, co-education very early and very effectively. In 1872, co-education was rolled out, and with four, within four years, a quarter of all girls were attending schools. It's astounding. But with the rollout of national um, education, what, was really, what, what they also needed was a curriculum. And morality became a central project during this time of nation building. And what girls were supposed to become in service of the nation were good wives and wise mothers of the new Japan. This sort of discourse emerges first as a concern to preserve our civilized manners in the face of westernization. But by the early 20th century, it becomes a sort of imperative to maintain a proper household as the fundament of the nation. What's interesting is that the tea ceremony gets rallied in this effort to make good wives and wise mothers of the nation. It gets taught in schools as a part of the girls' education across the countries, included in textbooks for morality classes, taught after school in, um, in club activities as a way of creating good Japanese women. Instruction focused largely on bodily comportment, the very strict physical discipline demanded of ritual preparation. So for example, when I pick up the tea scoop, you know, what, what is the angle that my arc should, uh, the arc that my arm should trace, or what is the angle of my wrist? A very, very minute um, attention to detail. Um, by, the by 1900, women's magazines was, were rating this, radiating this out yet further, this association between tea ceremony, women's practice, and focusing on the bodily compartment that goes on with it. By the 1920s, the radio comes to Japan, and within three years, there's the first radio broadcast of the tea ceremony, but it's within the women's section of the radio broadcasting and focusing on what is the bodily comportment that's necessary for doing the tea ceremony. Now, it's one thing to enact something Japanese, like what the women are doing, or to appreciate a Japanese object, like what the men are doing. But it all remains kind of very vague. There's always still this question of what is this Japanese-ness? Now, in order to define this, they needed, who else? My favorite people as a professor, the intellectuals. The intellectuals were very important for explicitly defining what is Japanese about the tea ceremony. And I'll mention just one quite quickly, Okukura Kakuzo. Um, Okukura was kind of a quirky character. He dressed in Nara period clothes sometimes, rode horse, then rode around on horseback. But he was also very important because he started the Asian collection at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which I highly recommend. He was very good friends with Isabella Stewart Gardner and many of the, the Boston Brahmins. And he was in New York at the time and gave a series of lectures in 1905 that became a book in 1906 called The Book of Tea, which he wrote in English. And the Book of Tea projects the tea ceremony as not merely an expression of Japanese culture, but its origin. He basically defines what it is, what is essential to Japanese culture vis-a-vis -vis comparisons with the West, looking at various aesthetic sensibilities, daily practices, cultural objects, um, et cetera. And I won't go into detail, but I, I do recommend it as um, intriguing reading, actually. He was quite a colorful author, if you haven't had a, a look at this book yet. Now, if you're gonna be an expert on Japan in the West, 1905, 1906 was a pretty good year to be one because Japan had just defeated Russia and everyone was wondering what lay behind it. So the Book of Tea comes out and it's an instant international hit. It comes out in multiple runs, translated into a dozen languages within a decade. It, you couldn't keep it on the shelves. The Book of Tea sat on the desks of Frank Lloyd Wright, of Martin Heidegger, of E.E. E. Cummings, of Wallace Stevens, everybody had it and knew it. And it was in a way, it was translating what is essential to Japanese, cul uh, Japanese culture to the West. It doesn't come out into, in Japanese until 1929. But again, 
It's great timing. It comes on the cusp of a huge ethnological explosion in Japan in the midst of growing imperialism. Many people were wondering, as Japan was spreading out, what lies at the Japanese core? What is Japaneseness? It becomes a pressing question, and the tea ceremony is rallied within Japan to give answers. So we see a soul slew of books coming out in Japanese that produce a fully articulated ideology of the tea ceremony as a complete synthesis of the arts and ethics of the nation. So to, in sum, how did the tea ceremony become Japanese? It's the intersection of these three trends. First, it was in this nexus of women spreading it horizontally so that everybody knew what it was. It was as it was coming through the school systems and then through the media. The, the new capitalists keeping tea connected to power, keeping its, its um, powerful cultural symbolism very high, as well as the intellectuals defining and articulating what is particularly Japanese about it. And in this intersection of these three actors who didn't always get along, we find tea remade into both a medium for defining it, the nation, as well as a means to create good national members. Um, if I have any more time, I can bring an example for today or I can stop. Um, one minute. All right. Then I'll just wrap it up there and um, leave it to, to questions. Thank you.